Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, can you guys hear me? This audio thing has just been a disaster tonight. Do me a favor. Can you call Marco, please, and just figure it out? Okay. The audio is on. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I wish you guys had told me in the first 10 minutes um, or so because everyone kept giving me questions. And then I found out that you couldn't hear me. But here we are. We're here together again. I'm really bummed that you didn't hear what I was saying. I was answering questions and to, you know, whatever. We're back. All right. Let's go again. More questions, please. Is there a non-surgical neck lift? Well, yeah. I mean, there are different forms of, you know, procedures that are considered neck lifts or called neck lifts that don't involve surgery, but they're not going to give you as impactful of a result. That could be anything from thread lifting to um, some filler if people say will cause and will create a neck lift, that's often not the case. Um, there's face tight, which is a radio frequency energy that can tighten up the skin and to some degree create a lift. But of course, your most powerful lift are going to be the surgical ones. We were hearing that you took off the headphones. Ah, so it was working with the headphones on and it took the headphones off. And I lost this, this audio. It sucks. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I'm bummed about that. I like when things work in a fluid way. But we're gonna we're gonna work with it. We'll keep going. Uh, Lila, do you do under the chin lipo to give some definition to the jaw area? Yeah, sometimes we do that. Um, absolutely. Uh, it's a good surgery. You know, the, the thing to remember with uh, submental lipo, as I talk about in one of the videos, is that there are different things within the neck that can give you fullness. And some of that is targeted with the submental lipo, like the subcutaneous space where some of the fat is. But you don't go deep to the platysma muscle with that approach. So occasionally, um, some of the fat pockets, fat deposits can be deep. The only way to address that is going in there with a deep neck surgery. So submental lipo, I often quote people about a 20 to 30% improvement. It's usually better than that, but I like to keep their expectations lower for this uh, more minimally invasive procedure. Um, yeah, you guys got to see my daughter briefly before she went to bed, but uh, I'm bummed. She was trying to give you guys messages and everything, and it's too bad my computer wasn't picking up the audio. Uh, why doctor don't operate on people with depression? Well, that's not always true. I mean, many of my patients have uh, clinical depression and are on antidepressive medications. I mean, much of the population is, you know, I mean, there's a good percentage of people who have depression. And it's not to say that they're not candidates for surgery. You just have to make sure that they're, you know, in the right state of mind to undergo, especially an elective cosmetic surgery. But um, it's pretty normal to uh, operate on patients who have some degree of depression as long as it's well controlled, um, you know, with medications or therapy or the like. Uh, infraorbital rim implants, I don't, I don't do them. Uh, I, I think that they can potentially help, but in, in the right hands. I mean, you know, you, got, you have to go to someone who's doing implants in that area all the time. There's a lot of uh, room for error, and oftentimes I find that patients feel that like the sizing was off, and they they thought they were gonna like it, and they they didn't and they got them removed. I mean, I hear about that very frequently, but there are some experts out there who do those implants in a fairly reliable way. Um, Shay, you can schedule a consultation through our office. The info is all in our bio on YouTube and just Google my name. You'll, you'll, you'll find our contact info. Um, feel free. We do video consults routinely uh, as a first line type of consultation for patients. And then you're always welcome to come in person too. But we book many consults off the, just the video. Um, and we have people calling in from all over the place, which is really nice. And uh, Dissa says, I finally got to participate in a live. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Sorry for the audio issues earlier. 
Um, that's not common, but it can happen. And then uh, Jinx is asking about fibromyalgia. Yeah, people have surgery with fibromyalgia. They can sometimes have some increased pain afterwards because fibromyalgia, they're generally more sensitive to, to pain stimuli, but not a reason to totally avoid surgery. Uh, what else? No work or fillers. At what age do you recommend a facelift? There's no specific age that you need to be, but I usually don't operate on patients in their 30s when it comes to a facelift. Uh, for me, late 40s into 50s is an appropriate time for the majority of people. Uh, how is CCCA treated? Cicatricial um, alopecia is, um, you know, it's it's a difficult thing to treat, but any anything that may have caused it um, needs to be, first of all, taken care of. And then sometimes steroid treatments are used. And for some patients where there's stability and no active inflammation, you can do a hair transplant. Uh, okay. Didn't sound good with the headphones. I appreciate that feedback. I won't be using them anymore. Uh, I was trying to have them for more noise cancellation because my daughter was still up and, and singing. Um, but uh, that backfired, but that's okay. We learned our lesson. Getting a fat transfer next week, does it help with smile and smile lines as well as they claim? You know, fat transfer, Todd, can be a, a bit tricky, um, you know, because you don't know how much of that fat's going to survive. You don't know which areas it's going to take better than in other areas. Uh, could be effective. You hope to not get clumps of fat that, you know, build up from the procedure. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that it helps. It's definitely an alternative to just getting HA filler and it could be longer lasting, but realize that it's, you know, only a, a portion of it um, survives. What do you think about jaw reduction surgery, Shay? It's not a procedure that I do in the practice, like the whole V-line surgery. I think that it, it can be a nice procedure for some for really reshaping the lower third of the face and then in turn, changing proportions in a dramatic way. I think it can be a very feminizing procedure, uh, but it does have risks and, you know, uh, that has to be discussed with patients in advance. I know in South Korea, they do a lot of that type of surgery. Um, don't forget to hit the like button. Yes, Shelly, you're right on the money with that. Yeah, guys, whoever hit the like button in the previous chat, um, the one we closed off. So do that now for this one, please. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, it's 28, except I'm just looking for good questions here. Why do you do virtual consultations? I would prefer meeting in person. Well, Ebony, we started off with virtuals. Well, for two different groups of initially, it was for people who would uh, reach out to us from, you know, far away places relative to New York City. And then with COVID, we switched to virtual only as an initial kind of screening consultation. And we like the general flow of it. And I have some friends and colleagues who are surgeons who also in, enjoyed it. So we don't um, like keep people from coming into the office before making a decision on surgery. We always welcome that. But we start with a virtual consultation for everyone so that there is... Um, uh, just consistency across the table for the way that we do things in the practice. And because I honestly enjoy it and I can be here in the comfort of my own home sometimes when the timing is right and uh, have my mask off and we can meet and it's a good initial way to meet. And many of our patients book surgery successfully off of the virtual. And I've never really been so shocked when I see someone in person and we have to change the plan completely. That doesn't really happen. Um, there are times when I do a virtual consultation and I'm just not sure if I can offer the person a surgery. And even if they think they're sure, uh, we still might make them come in so that we can meet and see if, if the, the surgery is really the right thing for them, at least, you know, in our practice. Uh, what else? My thoughts, Samir, on 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is topical. Yeah, I mean, there's topical finasteride um, uh, medications. They're still fairly experimental. It seems like that they are working to a degree, probably not as effective as the oral form, but definitely an option for some people who, you know, don't want 
the the pill. So uh, we'll see with more studies if that ends up kind of sticking. Uh, but but yeah, it, it seems like it will eventually be a, a decent option. But I'm not sure that it's going to be a replacement for uh, the oral. We also like oral minoxidil in the practice over topical. Seems better tolerated, um, better compliance, and uh, usually some better results. Uh, is it possible to have a good amount of reduction of the dorsal hump while still maintaining good nasal function and not widening the nose? Yes, uh, you can reduce the dorsal hump very efficiently, uh, but what happens with the dorsal hump coming down, as we talk about in some of the rhinoplasty videos, is that you can get an open roof deformity. So it's like, imagine you have like a roof on a house and you just cut the roof off. Now you have like a widened area, right? And so you have to close the roof. So that can be done with grafting, but oftentimes we create uh, lateral osteotomies, medial osteotomies, so re-breaking of the bones to recreate the, the dome or the, the roof uh, there. So, so that's how, and by doing so, you actually create more narrowing um, of the dorsum. So, and there's no reason why function has to suffer from that type of approach when it's done properly. Um, Kim, upper blepharoplasty, how common brow drop or brow compensation? So upper blepharoplasty, it's important to be conservative with that type of procedure. First of all, this is removing of the upper eyelid skin excess. And if you remove too much, you can get a hollowing of the um, upper like supratarsal area. So you have to be very careful with that. And sure, you could get some brow compensation, but the most important thing is to put the brows in the proper position first before doing a brow lift uh, when at all possible. I mean, that, that is the proper way to do uh, brow lifting and upper blepharoplasty. When you do facelifts, do you pull the muscle forward first, then the skin? Yeah, my approach is a more of a deep plane type approach, uh, Nurly. So I develop um, a skin flap that's partial, and then the rest is a composite flap of skin and smaz. And then we're pulling on that smaz. So that's like the muscle that you're referring to. And so the tension is on that muscle. And then any extra skin that comes, we then remove the extra skin and close with no tension. That's like the modern kind of a deep plane approach, facelift. Why do you prefer neck lifts versus neck liposuction? Um, it's, I wouldn't say I, I prefer one over the other. It just depends on what we're treating and what the person's goals are. Um, neck lifts are appropriate. So there's different, right? So I would recommend everyone review our submental uh, or double chin uh, video on YouTube because it goes through all of these different options. So there is a there's a deep neck lift where the incision is just made here. And we go in there, we do a platysmoplasty, we remove some deep neck fat, sculpt some of the deep muscles, that type of work. That's good for a younger patient where they're not significantly sagging yet. Um, as people get older and there's skin laxity that develops in jowling, you need to do a lateral approach combined with the submental approach to resolve that extra skin, the extra slack in the system. So that's like the more advanced kind of surgical stuff. But submental lipo is okay if the main problem is some extra fat there, there's not much extra skin, people aren't looking for a very dramatic change. But if someone has a really full neck and they're looking to really recreate this acute angle right here, the cervical mental angle, if they're looking to recreate that angle and maybe get the angle they never had before because of just the way they were born with extra stuff, you can't reliably do that with just submental lipo. You might get a home run here or there, but oftentimes, you know, you'll kind of fall short of a, of a great result. You might get an okay result. If you look um, at our Instagram, we posted a before and after recently, actually, this was just so if you guys aren't subscribed, you know, to the Instagram, you should be, please. Uh, this second to last post is a result of someone who had submental lipo. I told her, I always tell people 20 to 30% improvement. I don't like to promise more than that. But surely, you know, she had more than that, probably on the order of maybe 50%. But there's still something there. And that's something 
by that something I'm talking about this area here is in the deep neck space. So it's an area that's beyond the platysma muscle in an area that we can't get with cannulas doing submental lipo or cool sculpting or any of those like Kybella. They don't get to the deep neck. So the purpose of a deep neck surgery, like so for someone like her, and I did give her the option, but it's more involved. It's more surgery. It's more cost. It's more downtime. Not everyone wants like a big cut under here, you know, so I get that. But in order to give her that complete, you know, re-sculpting of the neck, that extra 40% or so, we would have had to go deep. And so that is a good example of the purpose of um, deep neck surgery and why, you know, it can create a more impressive result, but it's all about risks and benefits and, you know, what people are interested in. So let's keep going. Paul, thanks for the compliment on the hoodie. You know, the, these are available. We, we, we have made these hoodies. This was our first merch, and uh, they're available on Shopify, if you like. Uh, we're getting into scar gel, so we are. Actually, I have it right here. I, I, I didn't. I didn't realize that I was going to have it right here, to be honest with you. But here it is. So we've tried um, different scar gel formulations, and you see, this is number seven. So number seven was our favorite one. And uh, it's a really nice formulation, three different oils, all implicated in wound healing. Um, so they all have wound healing properties. You know, it's a kind of more scientifically based scar gel. And then we played around with different um, silicones to try to get the proper formulation where it felt good when you applied it. We were looking for a matte finish, not a shiny finish. So we want to come out with this kind of premium scar gel uh, product and we're in the process of look so the formulation is done i worked with an organic chemist on the formulation went through a bunch of different versions we everyone in the office tried it and you know friends and family and um it, it feels and you know it seems to work great and so we are going to be putting it together with like a co-packer um we'll have a few hundred of them uh, hopefully in the next few months and um you know get labeling and all that kind of stuff uh, we've never done this before so it'll be interesting uh but yeah it'll be our first foray into like kind of the products uh, uh and then eventually we'll do some hair stuff and whatnot but but the scar gel should be exciting and you know i do a lot of surgery so you know scar gel is relevant and uh, we looked at what was on the market and felt that you know we can do something that would positively impact um, you know, people and the field. So that is what we're working on. Thank you, Radioactive. Uh, can you gain weight after lipo for additional fat transfer? I'm already small and hip dip fat transfer didn't take all the way. Uh, yeah, sometimes if you have enough on you and you gain more weight, you can do another fat transfer. Sure. Uh, can you treat areata universalis? Well, jack inhibitors can temporarily help restore hair, but you have to be on the pill, uh, you know, all the time. So I, I just chose not to do it. I, I didn't, it's an, it's a pretty intense, you know, immunosuppressive medication. So I decided not to do that because I have a you know, young daughter and she's always sick and I just didn't want, um, uh, you know, to, and we have other, uh, we have other medications running around in the family. And so we, we, I just decided for myself not to be on that type of pill. Um, can you gain weight? Okay. We did that one. All right. We're, we're moving along here. Sorry guys. It's like, there's a lot of questions. All right. Oh my gosh. I'm like scrolling down, scrolling up. Where did I leave off? Okay. My doctor in India said he does hair transplant surgery um, on his own without technicians. He says he feels more comfortable doing alone. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's an interesting question, Leela. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to do hair transplants alone. You know, it's funny because we had a patient recently come in for, I forgot what, but uh, it wasn't for a facelift, but she had mentioned something about how uh, a doctor told her he was going to do a facelift by himself uh, without any help. I don't think that's anything to be proud of. I think um, 
facelift surgery, hair transplant surgery, most of these surgeries, any, any surgery really, um, you should have help, uh, experienced good help um, that help that then helps the procedure go more smoothly. Uh, if, for example, there's bleeding, which is associated with surgery, especially on the head or neck, head and neck areas, uh, you need help to have someone stop the bleeding so you can continue to work. It's not a good idea to just go in with two hands and expect to do everything. It's also exhausting, especially a hair transplant takes all day and a facelift takes a while too. You need the proper help. So uh, I personally, if someone said that to me, I would go somewhere else where they had good help to get the job done. I mean, you don't want to have 10 technicians where five of them are terrible and are going to mess up you know, your graphs or mess with your surgical results. But if you have a few really good people, that then helps a lot. Uh, what features would you primarily concentrate on in a female with hard features to allow for a gentler, more feminine face? You know, this uh, that's um, it's a good question, but it, it's hard without any photos to kind of point stuff out. Uh, in general, you have to look at, you know, the, the various, you know, thirds of the face, the, the, the you know, the top third. Um, a lot of times the, the brow ridge can be kind of, uh, prominent um, and and reducing that can feminize a face. Uh, middle third, a lot of times the nose is a very like in my face, right? The nose prominent feature, and reducing that can often feminize the face. Uh, and then the lower lower third, that's where I had mentioned earlier about V line surgery can sometimes be helpful or versions of V line surgery. I mean, it doesn't have to be a V line surgery, but uh, kind of slimming the lower third with other methods too. Sometimes it's masseter Botox, maybe a combination of filler could feminize the face as well. Uh, okay. And a lip lift. Lip lift really does wonders for feminizing a face. All right. So uh, what else? Profound RF on the lower face. Is it safe and effective to do it more than once? Well, oftentimes they will recommend doing it more than once. I, I don't do profound. I don't, um, it's not a system that I use. I don't use radio frequency in my practice. I tend to stick more with surgical types of um, procedures and refer out for, for things. But profound uh, is like a microneedling and radio frequency type of um, device. And, and yeah, usually would require more than one treatment, but you'd have to talk to someone who does it often to see the frequency, uh, a recommended frequency of treatments. Thank you, C. Green. I appreciate it. Hello, Dr. Gary. Does minoxidil have side effects if it goes systemic? Is it true that conditions like seborrheic dermatitis can affect absorption? Uh, well, systemic minoxidil, it's um, antihypertensive. So at low doses, the way we give it for hair, usually quite safe. Um, very safe, actually. There's very few reported side effects. But at higher doses, it can cause things like pleural effusion, water retention, uh, low blood pressure, you know, lightheadedness, things like that. But at low doses, I give two and a half milligrams a day for men and about one milligram a day for women. It doesn't really tend to uh, impact much. I haven't seen any side effects play out in my practice. Uh, how do you address significant buckle fat when doing a facelift? It's very rare that I feel like a buckle fat is so prominent that it needs to be removed. So I tend to avoid removal of the buckle fat. But with a deep plane facelift, you can usually see the buckle fat and you can remove it if, if necessary. All right. Someone used Clobetasol for frontal fibrosing alopecia, FFA, for one year. I see some improvement. Do I have to keep using it for the rest of my life? You know, it's usually Clobetasol... And other steroid uh, treatments, especially for like FFA, I usually leave that management to some dermatology colleagues. So um, definitely, you know, reach out to them and, and talk to them about it because you might reach a point where you have stability and you might not need to use it for forever. Uh, but it's not a condition that I actively manage in the practice. I always look for it because when it comes to a transplant, you don't want to be transplanting an FFA patient um, unless they've had a long course of remission. So I look for it, but I don't like, I'm not the one that prescribes them all the steroids and all of that. I usually refer out to a specialized dermatologist for that. Uh, do you have patients with MS who get Botox fillers? Are you a candidate or no? 
Um, yeah, MS, you have to be a bit careful. Fillers should be safer. Botox, you just have to be careful because it's a neurotoxin and how that could definitely talk to your neurologist about that um, before undergoing the Botox. I don't actually do Botox and filler anymore. I stopped about a month ago uh, in the practice because I was getting surgically busy or, and, um, I just felt that it, it wasn't worth it to keep kind of like getting, uh, pulled away to do the injectables. So I've stopped doing them. Um, maybe one day I'll have like a nurse injector or someone who I can help train and have them do it in the practice. But at this time I'm referring out for all injectables. We do PRP, but that's the only one. Um, and it's been fine. You know, I, I've learned that every time I drop a certain procedure or stop doing something I don't want to be doing, it all works out. Um, and today was actually my last day at the Brooklyn VA. Um, I'm still going to be doing some uh, resident training every other Friday at the Manhattan VA. But today marks the end of my stint at the Brooklyn VA. And I've been there for about four years, uh, going down as the time went on on my involvement, but, uh, today was my last day there. So it's kind of a bittersweet moment. And, um, they made a really nice card for me and had a nice lunch. And, uh, I can show you guys the people there are super cool. And this was some of them that, that showed up to, uh, the little lunch party. So yeah, really nice people. And this was me earlier today with my oversized card. And uh, yeah, it's bittersweet. It kind of detaches me from some of the ENT work that I, you know, trained so hard in and spent so many years doing. Uh, but it allows me to focus in on the facial plastics and all the hair work that I do. And it's time, you know, I mean, we have consultations booking out into like November right now. And and the only reason we're able to kind of get pe some people in sooner is because I've created more time on my schedule because of, you know, not doing as much VA and all that. So we're working to accommodate everyone. All right. So what else? Uh, do you prescribe topical finasteride in your practice? You know, Lexi, I don't at this time. It's still a bit too experimental in my mind. I don't consider it first line treatment. And, um, you know, it's maybe it will eventually become part of the armamentarium for me, but for now I'm not prescribing it. I know some people do a compounded thing with it. You know, maybe one day I'll do that too. Not at this time. Uh, Jacob, thanks so much. Uh, Nina, how uh, does repeated Botox cause atrophy of the muscle? Yeah, it, it does. It does actually cause atrophy of the muscle. Uh, you know, uh, if you don't, use it, you lose it, right? As they say. So when you have Botox and you're paralyzing muscle, you're not using it. And so uh, it does atrophy, you know, if you do it too frequently. Uh, Lee from South Central, is it possible to shadow you, Doc? I'm in college. We don't often take uh, folks for shadowing um, because the surgeries we do are fairly intimate. And uh, a lot of times patients don't really want extra people in the room. Uh, but reach out to the practice, and if we can try to accommodate you in some way, we will do our best. And, uh, yeah, definitely hit that like button. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's see. Can finasteride make my hair worse? Uh, unlikely. It's unlikely to make your hair worse. Finasteride, just like minoxidil, can cause an early shedding period, but that goes away. Um, you know, it does, of course, have real side effects. We talk about it in our finasteride video, but, um, you know, overall, it's very well tolerated. Uh, oral versus topical finasteride, we discuss in detail, fourth dimension, uh, in our finasteride video. It's up on YouTube. Please check it out. And it's a very detailed breakdown, and we talk about both oral and topical. Fat transfer for the under eye, I think, can work in experienced hands. You have to be careful not to cause clumping. Uh, and the under eye is a super delicate area. So it's got to be done by someone who does that stuff often. Can you do a surgery video on Nicki Minaj? Sure, Trap Doll. We can add her to our list. We are working on 
like increasing the frequency of celebrity videos. Um, is it my favorite type of video to do? No, to be honest with you guys. Um, we do it because that's what people want. And um, every time we try to fight what people want and we say, and I say, oh, I've got this great idea for like an educational video and we put it out there. Oftentimes it pales in comparison as far as views and all of that to what we get on our celebrity videos. So instead of fighting it, we're, uh, if, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, as they say. So we are embracing it and trying to kind of steer more towards celebrity videos that have some educational elements, of course, built into it. And, uh, you know, hopefully won't piss too many of them off. That's, uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll keep it tasteful and we'll see where it goes. We're doing a few other things. So I talked about the scar gel earlier. Um, we're introducing a new type of segment, new type of video for the channel, which is going to be like surgical games. So we're trying to take a page out of Mr. Beast's book and seeing how our stuff could work with his style um, of like hosting sort of a, a game show or a contest. And so we're organizing something now where it's going to be like medical simulations and medical trivia and a lot more fun, less like me sitting in front of a camera and just talking and more just like hosting a show. And we're hoping to expand on that. Eventually, maybe bring some other YouTubers on or some celebrity, other celebrities or whomever, you know, wants to be involved in that. Um, and just folks who are, want to compete for prizes and that sort of thing. So we're starting that. We're working on our first uh video um, planning now for that um, and also we have the surgical camera set it's all built it's great um, it, it looks and it works well so we have the streaming stuff going uh, we tested that so now we're just trying to find the right case to do like a live surgery we want to you know um, start off properly and and basically do something like this but like actual surgery like live in action so that is something we are in the process of planning and hopefully we'll get that off the ground for you guys soon. So lots of stuff in store. You know, we're always thinking of trying to think of new ways to reinvent ourselves and to keep you guys engaged and learning and seeing some, you know, fun stuff too. And if you guys have ideas, you know, always let us know. Uh, I'm thinking of getting a hair transplant, FUE, but I'm afraid of scars. I suffer from hyperpigmentation. Yeah, I mean, even FUE has little dot scars that it leaves behind. So don't forget that. It's not a, a strip scar, FUT, right? But you still get these little dot scars. Now, I've never seen in, in our hands with the device, the WAS, you guys know I use the WA system from Belgium. Um, I've never seen any really prominent scars from FUE on the back of the scalp. Um, is it possible? Sure, that you can get some hypertrophied um, scars, but, uh, you know, it's overall quite safe. I really haven't seen any, any major problems at all um, from our cases for the donor. Uh, how long for recovery time after a facelift? Well, Natasha, the first two weeks are, you know, the, the worst of it, bruising, swelling, that sort of thing. But then the incisions and the overall swelling takes many months to fully resolve. But I'd say the first two weeks are, you know, the worst of it. Uh, how much would it cost to take me from ugly to Brad Pitt? <laughs> You know, I don't know. Uh, our, our next celebrity video will likely be Tom Cruise. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, are there any blood tests that preclude you from a hair transplant if revealed to be outside the normal limits? That's an interesting question. I don't, uh, from Rufus, I don't routinely, Rufus Pennypacker. <laughs> um, I don't routinely get blood work on patients getting a hair transplant. However, um, I recently talked to a patient, for example, who has, who's HIV positive. And for that individual, it is a good idea to get blood work, such as viral load and CD4 count, for two reasons. Um, one reason, the primary reason, is to make sure that he can heal well. So if the blood work, if the viral load is low or undetectable and the CD4 count is high, 
then that tells me that likelihood is he's going to heal fine from that surgery. Um, however, if everything is out of whack and, you know, he's not well controlled on medications, well, not a good time to do an elective procedure. And then also, you know, over a certain uh, viral load, it becomes um, a bit unsafe for, you know, especially a hair transplant, there's many staff members and there's bleeding um, and we would prefer for everyone to be as safe as possible. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that the viral lo load is within, um, you know, good limits. So that is an example. So like when someone tells me their medical history, if I, or if someone says, you know, my, I always have anemia, like I have low blood counts. So that's a situation I know we're going to have bleeding from a hair transplant. So I'll, I'll get a hemoglobin or a CBC to check on that. But it, it's like targeted. It's not just like everybody gets blood work prior to a hair transplant. The majority of people do not. What else? Uh, Lilla, how long would you recommend an out-of-state patient stay in New York City after rhinoplasty? One week. It, we require it. It's not like optional because we need people to be here in case there's bleeding postoperatively, in case, you know, there's any issue um, with, you know, the splints that we use. And then we remove the splints at a week. So, uh, you know, that one's a non-negotiable. Same with facelifting. We tell people you have to be in town for one week. With most other surgeries that I do, um, in particular, hair transplants and uh, lip lift surgery, that is different. Most patients will be fine um, going home the next day. Uh, you know, they can fly back the next day if they want to. Nurley, can you do a bloodless surgery? I mean, most surgery has blood associated with it, so um, not really. I mean, are there times when there's such you know, little blood loss that it's almost like nothing. Yeah, but, you know, you go into surgery expecting there to be some blood loss. Uh, Marco added the double chin video, and we are over 50 likes, so that's good. I know I'm behind on these questions. Sorry, guys. Uh, what age would you consider hairline lowering to be appropriate given no current hair loss for John? So hairline lowering, especially when it comes to surgical hairline advancement, if that's what you're referring to, where we make the incision, all of that, and advance the scalp down, um, 35 would be the minimum uh, for a male. And yeah, we want no signs of any recession. Uh, but uh, yeah, but that surgery is usually more common in women. It's a little safer because they're less likely to recede. Uh, collagen, can it improve your skin texture? There's no strong evidence uh, on that as far as I know, um, based on like liter the literature. Uh, I might be wrong. There could be some studies out there, but, um, you know, skin texture. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of a soft call on that. I know it's being used, especially like people just eating like, like collagen, taking collagen pills. I don't think it's been well proven. All right. Will taking one milligram finasteride every other day be as effective as every day? Uh, yeah. You know, most of my patients who do that switch to every other day are still fine as far as controlling their hair loss. So clinically, I haven't found it to be a problem. Any tips or precautions on the overall procedure recovery time for male ethnic rhinoplasty? Uh, well, you just want to make sure that, you know, your surgeon's goals for you align with what you want. You know, a lot of times I find uh, people are creating more Caucasian noses and patients don't necessarily want that. I mean, some do, but many don't. So you need to make sure that you have like a clear, you have your vision outlined to your doctor and that they've, you know, processed it and have expressed to you what they plan on doing. Uh, that I think is the number one thing just to be on the same page. Is it required to remove previous nose filler before? I, I mentioned that earlier. I, um, yeah, I think for the most part, it's a good idea to remove the filler. It's not a requirement, but usually helps. Varun, what happened to your hair? Um, spend some time on the channel. You'll figure it out. But I have an autoimmune type of hair loss condition. We talk about it very frequently on the channel. Um, would the lip lift affect speech? 
I know there are lip lifts that go down to the muscle and there's yours that is just above, I believe. Yeah, so Grizzly or Grizzly's channel, <laughs> my lip lift goes right onto the muscle but doesn't like impact the muscle. So if you're not impacting the muscle, I haven't found any speech issues, especially after a few months of healing. Initially, there's tightness and that could potentially impact on speech to some degree. But as that tightness goes away after several months of surgery, uh, after surgery, it um, it just it ends up being fine. I haven't found any, none of my patients have ever complained of any long-term speech issues because we don't uh, manipulate the muscle itself. Uh, have you noticed a boost in confidence in clients or subscribers opinion? Hmm. I'm not sure what exactly that refers to, uh, boost in confidence, my confidence, the client's confidence. I don't know, but, uh, so far everything's going well, so we're happy. Uh, Varun. Yeah. Uh, again, watch our videos. You'll figure out why I can't have a beard. Um, okay. Yep. Make sure to like guys. We're almost at a hundred likes. Uh, all right. What else off subject? Are women able to have wide eyelids? Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not the best person to answer that. You can ask one of my ocular plastics friends and uh can you use hairs from other parts of the body for fue instead of using hairs from the scalp donor area is there a texture type quality if you use these hair? yeah so for mike so the f first line is always going to be from your scalp that's the hair of choice it's the most dependable uh, best for survival and um, just usually works the best for scalp uh, when someone exhausts that supply then we consider some body hair, usually neck, sometimes chest, sometimes back. And I usually don't go to other areas than that because, again, the reliability of your graphs goes down. Like the, the percentage that survive, um, the quality of it, the thickness of it, everything kind of changes as you get away from those areas. But the, after, so plan B would be like the neck. And then C would be chest and then back. Also, the healing is different. The healing is always the best on the scalp. It's less good on the neck and then even worse on the chest and the back. And the scars are a bit more obvious because the blood supply isn't as good in those areas. All right, we're going strong. I just jumped ahead by a lot, but I'm going to only take a few more questions because i got to prepare for my long day tomorrow. Uh, what are the common side effects in the extreme cases of overfilled lips? And to what extent is that level of fill reversible? Good question. So overfilled lips, uh, the biggest thing is scar tissue. Like how much of it is filler? How much of the filler has migrated outside of the actual red lip? Um, and can we fully dissolve it? Sometimes there's so much scar tissue that you're only dissolving, you know, a percentage of it. The rest is just kind of thickened scar from repeated um, filler. So it's not just the damage from the HA filler. It's sometimes damage from the actual needle pokes that have gone on repeatedly to get you those injections in the first place. Um, do you have Airbnbs or other convenient places to stay for out-of-state patients? So, I mean, we're in the heart of Manhattan. So there's like a million hotels uh, that are right around our office. So it's not an issue. I'm sure there are Airbnbs as well. But, uh, you know, we have a list of options for people um, just to kind of jumpstart the search for folks interested in coming over to see us. Uh, but you, you won't have an issue finding a place to stay um, during your time here. All right. So... Uh, if plastic surgery was completely reversible, which ones would you try on yourself? Ooh, that's an interesting question, Kat. I think if I were to, you know, some people mentioned my nose and that it's too big or whatever. I, I actually like my nose, to be honest with you. Um, so I wouldn't touch that. One thing would be like, lower lower eyelid area i have like some hollowing here and there's good light now so 
Um, you can't really appreciate it as much. Uh, this is just some like prominent muscle here. But as you look further down, it's fun of funny to do a facial analysis on myself. But listen, if I can dish it out, I should be able to take it, right? Um, but like there's some hollowing that I've had just, you know, congenitally. And it's, of course, it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. So like it would be nice to do something to fill that area in. Uh, maybe an implant underneath the infraorbital implant, as someone mentioned earlier, or a uh, lower bluff, or maybe some fat transfer to the area. But to be honest with you, for like, you know, I'm a pretty busy guy these days. Like we do a lot of stuff for YouTube for the practice. Uh, you know, I try to be a family guy as well. So can't really afford to have like serious downtime or potential complication or whatever. Uh, so I, I'm not venturing into that at this time. There's probably going to come a point where I'll be so bothered by something that I might consider doing a procedure. But so far, you know, I, I'm okay with what I got. Uh, uh, Tanya, thank you for the skin compliment. I think we'll release some skincare products in the future. You guys are always talking about my skin. Um, do you treat African-American skin? Well, um, you know, I'm not a skin guru. Uh, you know, that I say that for the dermatologist. So I have many African-American patients for the surgeries that I do. But when it comes to skin care, any kind of skin care for anyone, I usually will refer out to like a really good medical esthetician or a dermatologist. Uh, Mike, I followed your YouTube journey for a while. Wealth of great information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for following. We have a lot more in store. Um, and uh, what else? Let me see. Does PRP scalp treatment provide permanent results? The Nasus. You have to watch our latest video. It's on PRP. And it will answer your question. But the short answer is no, it is not permanent. Uh, you need to continue to do the PRP to see sustained results. This is... Um, the nature of all medical therapy, whether it be, well, really all medical therapy in general, uh, but especially for like, say, some uh, nasal functional nose issues, um, you know, those sprays that we give people, I mean, those are generally considered long-term things uh, for keeping down inflammation, for hair and hair restoration, the medical therapies are also such that you have to continue doing them and using them to see the results on your scalp, different from a hair transplant. All right, one more. Molesha. Hi, Dr. Gary. I keep having nosebleeds. I go to several ENT doctors, but still having nosebleeds. Well, uh, I would ask you, like, what did they say? Did they give you a diagnosis? Um, you know, chances are several ENTs are not all wrong. So uh, listen into what they're saying is maybe the cause of the nosebleeds. And uh, there are many causes of nosebleeds. The most common would be just some dryness and sometimes a prominent blood vessel at the front of the nose, of uh, the septum on the inside. So, you know, sometimes um, there's cauterization that can be done. Sometimes it's just a matter of increasing hydration to the nose. So, um, you know, one thing that I realized is that like, since our channel is so focused um, and my practice is so focused on the work that, you know, the topics that we talk about on, on the channel, it's hard to introduce like ENT topics. But as you guys know, I mean, that was my core specialty, right? So uh, I still have a wealth of knowledge, I would say, about dizziness, about, you know, things like sinuses and nasal breathing and, you know, throat stuff like vocal cord issues and uh, different cancers that happen in the head and neck. And part of me really wants to make videos about that too, because that would be super, I think, informative and would be fun. Um, but it deviates so much from what our channel, you know, focuses on. So I don't know, maybe one day I'll have a separate channel but because I don't do that clinical work as much anymore, and especially now that I've left the, the Brooklyn VA where I was doing more of that um, on a very part-time basis, but now I don't, won't be doing that at all. Like ear cleaning and like, you know, why do we get wax? What's the best way to get the wax out? Like I would love to make more expert videos because a lot of crap, pardon my 
French um, out there on YouTube, uh, you know, related to this. I saw like there was one of the top videos is from like a pharmacist talking about wax removal. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, yeah, I understand that, you know, they might, they might know certain things about, you know, wax drops, but, you know, it takes an ENT who's been removing wax for a while to, to, you know, and who understands like all the nitty gritties of the internal ear anatomy to, to truly put together like um, a good video um, that will be comprehensive and leave you with, with real knowledge and things you can take away. So I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll toy around with um, some ENT videos, maybe even on a separate channel. I, I have no idea. Um, you know, as this YouTube stuff progresses and grows, you know, I, I really didn't think this was going to be a, and every time I tell Marco, you guys know Marco by now, every time I tell him this, he, He's like, oh, come on. Like, he's like, I know, I knew that YouTube, uh, you know, had a lot of potential, but I didn't know, honestly, when we started doing all these videos that it had potential to attract all, you know, an audience and that you guys would be here supporting us. So we're super thankful for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so who knows? So we'll see what the, I don't know exactly what the future holds for us with, with YouTube and, and with, um, you know, different education uh channels but but we will keep uh working on it and maybe bring in other people who we can coach and who can start their own channels and we can help them out as well so we'll see and uh what is this top chat is that someone leaving a question or oh i don't know I, I, oh oh okay someone left the question my son has severe alopecia areata he is nine will jack inhibitor be a good option you know um uh, uh, so jack inhibitors it's something that i considered for myself but i also went to a dermatologist who specializes in alopecia areata and is very very familiar with jack inhibitors has like you know 500 patients that she's currently treating with it at columbia so that's who i trusted with like my jack inhibitor information so i don't know about its approval for you know nine-year-olds or its efficacy long term so i would say best to talk to a dermatologist who has specific experience in treating, um, you know, alopecia universalis, what I have and what your son seems to have. So uh, my dermatologist is, in case you want to know, is Dr. Bourdon at Columbia University in Manhattan. She's excellent at um, this type of work. So feel free to reach out to her and her team. But guys, thank you again. Um, sorry, we can't answer even more questions. It's just you know, I have limited time. I have to get some rest. I've got a hair transplant tomorrow, a bunch of other things to do. So again, have a good night. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, just a recap of stuff coming. Uh, more, more celebrity videos because you guys keep asking for them. I think Tom Cruise might be next. Uh, scar gel that we formulated now we're now we're like working on getting it you know made manufactured and we'll have that available for everyone um, surgical games that we're introducing to the channel as like a whole different type of experience so also will be somewhat educational but more fun and crazy so that should be cool and then our camera system is finally installed that will allow us to have super high definition footage for like when we go live, we want to do live surgery for everybody. So it's coming, you know, I think uh, probably in the summertime, a lot of this stuff will finally materialize and will be super fun to see where that takes us. So thanks again for being on this wild ride. Uh, and just a shout out again to my, uh, and some of them might be here tonight. Um, some of my uh, people at the Brooklyn VA, they've been so kind to me over the last four years and really welcomed me, supported me, and have been super enthusiastic for all the stuff that we're building online and as the practice has grown and all of that. So again, thanks everybody um, for the, the constant support and uh, I will see you again soon. Good night.